This is me, the Undead Viking, and this is Pocket Odyssey. Pocket Odyssey is just that. It is a quest RPG type board and card game uh, that is uh, a small little box, right? But there is so much game in this box. Um, it is a bit of an oddity, however. This is not going to be a game that is going to have some like straightforward, like, okay, here's your map, and here's your things you have to kill, and this is the spot you go. It doesn't work like that. With how this game works is, is that um, there's you have two to four players, and one of those two to four players is going to be the storyteller, meaning they're going to come up with the quest, going to come up with the the reason why um, your players are investigating or, or you know going on this adventure, and it doesn't necessarily you may adventure like going into a dungeon or whatever. There could be all kinds of different things. It all depends on what the storyteller um, decides to create out of the different quest cards that they draw. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So they create this story. And, and they work with the players to create a compelling story, create a fun story. And then the players themselves try to defeat that story. So, uh, and ultimately, yes, you, there are, you, the players you know, will have a, a win or whatever, but it isn't so much about the win, it's about how you get to that point and the story that you tell as it progresses through the different obstacles uh, that the storyteller sets up. So, uh, let me show you how this game is played. Um, it, it, it's very mechanics light, if you will, and that's because it is more about um, like the fun of the experience than it is so much about you know deciphering. Okay, my character has plus three to hit, plus four to damage, that kind of thing. That isn't what it's about. It's 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 about the interaction at the table and having fun. So uh, let me show you how the game is played. We'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, so this is Pocket Odyssey, and I'm going to talk about how the game gets set up and how what, what you're looking at in front of you, but just bear in mind right now what you're seeing is kind of a game in progress, so I've just kind of like taken a snapshot um, after the game's kind of gone on. It's like in the first act of the storytelling process that I referenced earlier, and um, the, the players are about ready to have their like encounter, their battle here, but... Before I dive into that and show you how that's done, let's just talk about how we got here. So I set up a three-player game. One person is the storyteller, and the other two people are going to be playing characters. Um, creating a character is really, really simple in this game. Um, it, it, you, know, you could hand it out randomly if you want, but mostly because this is kind of a cooperative storytelling effort in which, like, you know, the players, I mean, yes, there's winning and losing, but it isn't really about the winning and losing. It's about creating a fun atmosphere and a fun uh, time and a fun story that everybody gets to be a part of. And, and you know, and once again, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself here. It, it's a very, very good representation of a role-playing game, of a Dungeons & Dragons game. But I'll talk about that. Keep that in the back of your head here, and we'll talk about that once we uh, get to, like, my final thoughts about this. So, the mechanisms that you have here, um, as far as creating your character, is that each person is going to get, like, a character. And so, like, you have, like, this picture here, and then it, it, that that's the Ogre Slayer. And then it just gives you some, like, uh, reference points. Like, it's, you know, uh, he's a menace. Uh, you know, he's got great fortitude, he's got a great physique, you know, making he's strong and what have you. Um, this one is the Elfin Blood, you know, think, you know, Elf Archer kind of, uh, you know, like that trope, if you will. You know, nature-wise, keen sense, and stealth. And so, what those mean are, is that because this is a storytelling game, you're going to be working with the storyteller, and they're going to present certain things to you and say, this is happening, and you're going to try to suggest that your character is going to do something. Uh, whether or not it succeeds has a lot to do with this information that's on there. If you wanted to do a feat of strength and you're the Ogre Slayer, you'd say, well, I can do that, right? Because I have physique, and I can do that. And they can go, okay, yeah. That, that. And if it's something that's relatively simple, the storyteller might just let you do it. You know, It's like, oh, I want to pick up that big rock. Okay, well, yeah, you're strong enough to pick it up. If... Uh, you know, you, you are like, you know, the keen sense if you were the Elfin Blood character and you said, you know, it's like, well, I'm going to like search and see if I can uh, find a secret door. Now, maybe that's something that's difficult to do um, and normally nobody would be able to find it. But because you are of Elfin Blood and you have keen senses, you would be given a chance to roll. The big thing about whenever you roll for like an action like that is that if it's something simple, 
uh, either because it's just something simple like opening a door, uh, you know, uh, hiding behind a rock, things like that, that you could do, in, you know, like a, a normal person could do normally, uh, you, you just get to do it. If it's something that would be normally difficult uh, to do, or, or, you know, then um, you have to roll a four, five, or six on the die, or have a skill that kind of represents it. Like I mentioned, like picking up a big rock. You, you know, the story teller could say, yeah, you're strong enough to pick up the rock. You don't have to roll just because you're the Ogre Slayer. Now, if it's something that's impossible to do, like finding a really, really well-hidden secret door, maybe there's no chance. It would just, like, literally be impossible. But because you have keen sense, you'd get a chance to roll the die. And you, I roll a one, and it wouldn't work. But, you know, if you got a four, five, or six like that, then you could say, okay, yeah, you found the secret door. Then, so just keep that in mind. You know, that's, and once again, these aren't like hard and fast rules. It doesn't have like a chart that you look at and say, okay, well, if it's a, if it's a secret door, it's this. If it's, you know, lifting a portcullis, it's this. You are going to work with the storyteller, um, and the storyteller is going to work with the players to just come up with like a, an idea that, that makes the story interesting. Um, and I'll talk once again about that when I get to the final thoughts here, but just, just, bear in mind. All right, so a couple other things you're going to get is that each player is going to get one of these things, a personal goal. And it's just going to be, and technically, you know, to win the game, um, the, if you want to be on the winning side as a player, you have to, you know, complete the story, complete the, the mission, complete the quest that you're on, but also, at some point, get your personal goal uh, completed. Also, you're going to get one of these things that is a flaw. And a flaw just kind of like, as they say, this is what other people see you as. So, like, they're going to see the Ogre Slayer as an overconfident person. Um, they're going to see the Elephant Player as being cold-blooded. And, like, their, their personal goal is they have to outsmart their enemy. And so they have to find a spot to do that, to outsmart the enemy. All right, so other things that you see in front of you is you, you have the dodge, you, you have these... Uh, like abilities here and like your dodge points whatever and dodge points are going to be kind of your hit points and once we get to um the combat section talk about how combat works we'll talk about that in just a little bit but all right so um your skills are attack defense and special and you get three points to start with and you can put them anywhere you want you can see in this case i gave two attack to the ogre one attack to the elf and two to defense and then one to defense over here Special is if they have a power that asks you to roll a die. Neither of these players had a special power that asked them to roll a die, so I didn't put any points into special because it wasn't needed. Now, you do draw three powers, and then you get to, if you want, you can discard any of them that you want. Um, in the case of the Ogre Slayer, I just kept the Poison and the Hardy ability. Um, you know, Poison allows him to, well, poison an enemy, and Hardy allows him to, you know, take Strug off more damage. I did keep all three of the abilities for the Elf, the ability to create an illusion, uh, to dodge, and also to do a quick shot with the weapon. You also get to pick one loot card, and like, so I picked a magic bow uh, for the Elf, and I picked this magic monster shield for the Ogre Slayer. And, and other than that, you can come up with a name for your character. Um, the game actually gives you... Uh, a like a little name chart and which I thought was kind of cool just like you know here's some male names that you could use uh, and then here's you know some female names you could use so if you're having trouble coming up with a name for your character you can definitely do that um, I will say this if you're playing with like children or people that aren't familiar with role-playing games they do actually give you this card for like this legendary hero and it they're, they're probably just like you know they're just a more simplistic and very powerful character and when i played this with my son um i let him play a legendary character he's six years old and he had a lot of fun so i did like the fact that they included this but you know creating a character is always kind of like my favorite part of any role-playing game and so doing this is how we did it now i just want to quick show you that you know there are other you know classes that you can do you know like here's the pictures you can see dragon mage the phantom blade and so forth so there's definitely uh plenty of characters to choose from 
and there's plenty of these powers to draw from as well. So you, you, you're not going to have like the same old characters each and every time um, you're going to. And you know, the thing is, is that if you just wanted to create the characters that you wanted to create, I, I'm more almost more in favor of that than having a random character created. Because then you just get to play what you want to play, right? And you can have some fun with it. All right. So that's that. That's how you, 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 you'll spend a good, you know, 10, 15 minutes, I suppose, creating your character and getting it set up and getting everything picked. But after you're done with that, the story, and, and when you're doing that, the storyteller is going to take some time and they're going to draw four of these quests. What they're going to do is, and these things have like a little storyline for you, know, like all these little, like classic, you know, maze or the worst fears, death trap, bodyguards, things like that. Classic, uh, like, you know, plot points that you could use to create your story. You draw four of them and you're going to use three. And so, uh, these are the four I drew, like Infiltrate, Stealth, Competition, and Chase. Now, I already kind of went through all this and I, I want to get rid of Competition. I'm not going to use that one, so I'm going to put that one back. And so, what I had an idea of was after I, you know, thought about it for a little bit, my idea was um, the infiltrate. The players must stop an event from taking place before it's too late, an evil ritual or sacrifice, maybe a massive city, right? something like that. So I thought about this evil ritual, and then I actually saw these cards that represent this boneyard. So I was like, okay, so maybe there's a necromancer that's on the loose, and he's, a t he's you know, gotten a hold of like some like super powerful like ring of the dead or something like that right and the players have to find him find his secret lair and you know and and put a stop to it so that's gonna be the first part they're gonna have to search through the city and find him and then you know go ahead and infiltrate his lair to take him out and then you know stealth so my idea was with the stealth was after they actually find like the secret tunnels or whatever maybe they're just so filled you know, with, like, ghosts and evil entities and things like that, that they're going to get killed if they get caught. So now they're going to have to stealthily get by all these, um, you know, creatures and maybe just, like, in, you know, to, to eventually get to the point where they get to interrupt um, the, uh, the the ritual and, and they can stop the necromancer from, you know, changing superpower or what have you. And then, like, at the very end, it's a chase. So um, you, you stop the ritual, but he's going to run away. And the necromancer is going to, and, and if he can get to, you know, like a wagon that's leaving town, or maybe even just jump through a magical portal or something like that, you're going to chase him down, and that'll be like the third act. So, I, you know, so I've got this idea. I've got, I've got the three different acts that I'm going to do, but the first one's going to be infiltrate. Now, so I'm not going to, like, go through, like, a storyline here, but um, you kind of have to, you, you work with the players, and you just kind of both come up with a story that works, right? So you say, okay, well, you have to infiltrate the secret lair, but you have to find the secret lair first. So then, you know, you just, you, just like with classic D&D, you have to say, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the night guards, uh, the, the, you know, the night watch have said that they've, they, um, you know, seen a lot of like, you know, creepy looking people wearing robes coming in and out of the cemetery, uh, in the mausoleums late at night in the, in the, like the poor quarter of town. Okay. So now we're going to go and we're going to do that. And so you're going to like go through a process of like how to get in there. Maybe they find a mausoleum that's like, you know, uh, uh, like locked up tight that's supposed to be open. Um, it's locked up tight, so how do you open it? You know, you're going to go through the different skills or whatever that the people are going to have on their characters, and eventually they're going to figure out a way in. And once they figure out their way in, then you have this map. You have the Boneyard, right? And when you set that up, what you're going to do is you're going to have three levels worth of monsters per player. So we have two players. And you get this little... Uh, these these monsters that you have um, that that all have like uh, like the level is over here, and so like three levels with the monsters. So if I put a troll in there, that would be one. You know that would be three levels with the monsters. But what I did was I picked two like um, like low level uh, undead uh, creatures that are defending it. I picked some skeletons and some soulless ghosts. And so now they're going to have to do battle with those, and after they defeat them, then they're going to be able to go on to the second part of, uh, you know, the the, the storyline. And then, I, of course, I'm going to have to, pick, you know, pick a different map that they're going to have to get through. And, you know, which, I, oh, I was going to show you, 
you get a ton of these little cards that are going to be different maps and what have you, which are awesome. And I'm really, it's just like, I mean, I'll talk a lot more about just how much game is in this little tiny box of Pocket Odyssey, but, you know, just, it, it really is fantastic. But regardless, so how do you do combat? So, like, eventually it's what it's going to come down to is you're going to have to fight the monsters, right? So the way you set it up is you have these little cards, like here's a like an octagon and a square that are yellow and a blue circle. And so then you have a blue circle, you have an octagon, and you have a square. So those are those three monsters. And over here you have this, um, like a circle, uh, the, the old circle, uh, the blue square, and the blue octagon. And so then those would be those. Real simple, right? All right, so you might be saying, well, why do we have these little numbers on there? Uh, I, don't, I don't get that. Why are those on there? So monsters... Uh, to kill them, you have to attack them, and to attack them, you either have to use a ranged attack uh, to attack them from a distance, uh, or you have to get close to them and, and then attack them that way. So, the way that works is, uh, when you attack, you just, you're going to roll the six-sided dice, and you're going to add your attack score. Um, if you're using a power to attack, then you'd use your special ability. But you add your attack score, and then what you're going to do is you're going to look and see um, if, uh, like, your roll, after you modified it with your attack score, if your roll is higher than the base defense of the monster, plus any buffer or dodge bonus it gets. So, like, the Soulless Ghosts, have um, a base defense, uh, like, you know, if you look, they have three health, and they get a plus of nothing. So they have a base health of three. And if you look at the skeletons, uh, well, I guess skeletrons or whatever, but uh, the skeletons have a three, and they have a buffer of two. So with that buffer of two, what I've done is I've placed these little tokens on there. So if you attack a monster, and you beat its score. So like the Soulless Ghosts, you have to get a three uh, to beat them. Or with these, uh, these you have to get a five to begin with to beat them. If you beat the roll, like you, you, uh, you, you equal that amount or better it, you just kill it. You, it's done, it's gone, there's no like wounding it or anything like that. You've destroyed that monster. Um, if you don't, what will happen is, is that then if it, in the case of the skeletons, you're going to reduce the, the, the dodge or like basically the bonus hit points it has by one. In the case of these souls ghosts, since they don't have that, you're not going to reduce them at all. They're just going to be where they're at. So, uh, you know, like you basically have to keep fighting them. Now you might be wondering, well, why, why does the use don't have it? This has an attack value of five and these have an attack value of three. Um, and I'll explain how combat works when you when the monsters attack the players. But um, basically, obviously, the five is better than the three, and that's why they're kind of more powerful. And you also notice their special abilities. The skeleton, uh, when killed, this monster blows up into a blinding powder. Uh, any hero next to this monster rolls a die, and an odd number is blinded uh, till the end of their next uh, phase, uh, next turn. And then if the hero is wounded by the same, he must roll an even number or become a soulless themselves. So like the ghosts can actually like train like uh uh you know, change the player and, and basically kill them and yeah you can die uh but it's really really kind of tough this this game is um about the story and not killing off the heroes so to speak so all right so on your turn basically what you're going to do is you're going to take an action um if you what you can do is like uh when you when you move you're going to like you, you, the way you can move is that you're actually going to be using um, like cards uh, to show your movement. The cards you will use to show movement are actually going to be um, the power cards. Uh, so what if you were going to move a short move and then make an attack, you're going to use this um, like the short side like so uh, to do so. If you're going to make a long move, you, you just do that, but then you're unable to make an attack if that's the case. Um, you can 
uh, ready a ranged weapon uh, to attack, and then you'll be able to attack with it the next round. Um, that's kind of like the, the downfall of the ranged weapon. Obviously, a ranged attacks, you know, you don't have to endanger yourself technically because the monsters aren't next to you, uh, but it does normally take two turns. However, I did give... Um, you know, my, the, the, the elf, uh, the slayer's bow, on a ranged attack, this bow may be used to attack two cargoes that are positioned, oh no, that's the, that's the wrong one, there's one that allows you, so that one allows you to attack two people in a line, um, there's one of these loot cards, actually, uh, and now I'm kind of upset that I didn't do that, there's one of these loot cards, uh, that allow you to, um, uh, you can, you can fire it, uh, like, you know, just, as one thing, right? You know, so you don't have to actually uh, load it and then fire it. You can, it's all one action. Uh, yeah, it's the Staff of Missiles, this one right here, where it says, uh, you may make a ranged attack without prepping it. However, on a miss, the enemy does not lose uh, DP dodge points, which are these things that are right over here that I was referencing. Oh, and I totally forgot one other thing. Uh, I apologize. So there's these little loot buttons like that you get each person gets one of these and it just kind of on a little extra thing and so like you know an unending beer mug and uh, a talking crow and so like the players can use those like for whatever like if you were trying to inspect something like you have a talking crow and like you can tell the crow to go and fly and do like surveillance or whatever and then the crow would come back and tell you what was going on um, an unending beer mug you could use that if you're fighting some goblins you could put that out and the goblins could like drink it or, or you know and then they could get drunk and then you could be able not have to fight them or something like that so cool things like that allow the players to kind of role play out situations but anyway again so combat it, it's it's very much similar like each player will go but when they go so like let's say uh the blue player uh is the elf and so what will happen there is like she could probably use her bow to line up these two and she's gonna fire at those two so she's gonna fire at um this well no she's gonna ready it she's gonna ready her bow uh to fire next round because she wants to be able to line up two of them and fire fire them so that's that's gonna be your action when she gets done with that action, then all of the monsters that match her color are going to get an action as well. And so what they're going to end up doing is they're all going to move. And so then the storyteller you know, is going to say, okay, well, you know, this one will move right there. And, you know, this is, you know, you don't have to be precise or anything like that. Once again, you're, you're not, you're not trying to, um, you know, uh, be that much of a, 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 a rules lawyer in these situations but you know try to make sure that they don't go through walls if they happen to be on the picture or anything like that you know so you don't break the immersion of it so then after they go now then the the uh the ogre slayer would go and we'll actually give up to see an attack because he can walk right up to this one right there because you know he was within that range so he's going to be attacking uh, one of these soulless ghosts, and you're like, oh, well, good, you know, because you know, we want to take those guys out because they can do a lot of damage. So, with the soulless ghost, what you're going to do is I'm going to add two to my roll, and because they have a, uh, a three defense, I'm going to be able to kill it because the fact even if I roll a one, it's going to be enough. So I roll a two, I'm going to add two to that, it's going to be a four, and that one's going to be taken out, and we're going to remove that. So combat's really simple. The combat isn't meant to be, like, super difficult or anything like that i think it's just one of those things where you can allow people to shine and have really awesome moments um so then after he goes then like yellow would go and so they, this one would move right up to the elf like so this one would move right up to him and this one would, you know just i'm just moving them without using the card here um so then there you go so they didn't get to attack but if they do attack what happens is like this skeleton, which is undamaged right now, what they were going to do is the skeleton has an attack value of three. And so what the players will do is they're going to roll a die and they want to either match or roll higher than that number so they don't take any damage. Each player will start with three dodge points plus one for each each point of defense they have and so the elf is good will then have five dodge points so we're going to go ahead and give her five dodge points like so and then he's going to have to have four total dodge points because he's got one defense when you roll you're just going to you're trying to beat that 
that role. And so you, but like, um, uh, but you know, if you roll, so like, let's say she got attacked by that, and so we're gonna, you have to roll three or better. And so we're gonna go, so a five. So then you wouldn't take any damage. If you do roll lower, then you take damage in the in the frame of taking dodge points, and you lose those, so you're unable to continue dodging. If you ever run out of dodge points, um, you then can get wounded. One thing about being wounded, while well, it does stink, uh, you can only take an action every other round. But for the most part, the baddies or the monsters, is there, uh, but the game calls them baddies. The baddies do, will just ignore you. They won't actually fight you unless you do something to antagonize them, which they will then attack you. If they attack you and and hit you again, then you are considered to be killed. And if you do killed, then you will discard all your cards that are associated with your hero, and then you just create another hero from scratch. And the new hero begins play um, after that combat ends. So you don't really like lose anything, but like that hero. And sometimes if your hero dies, it does actually, you know, like it is a it is a good you know part of the story, if you will. So it's it's not exactly. Uh, I mean. It, 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 it stinks if your hero dies, but once again, this is part of the story and what you're trying to tell. And, you know, and, and, you know character death can sometimes be quite epic at times. So just keep that in mind. All right, so after the battle's done, you destroy all the monsters. You go on to the next phase. Everybody's going to gain a level. Um, th when you gain a level, you're going to get... Uh, you're, you, you're going to get to add another point to one of your stats uh, that you have. Um, and so you just add that onto your character sheet. Um, and after you add those to your stats, then you get to, uh, um, you're going to be able to get to roll a die. And if you get a four or more, you get to draw another loot card to add to your, add to your, uh, your, your different abilities that you have. And then the players can discuss who the MVP of that fight was. And then, if whoever they decide the MVP was as a group, they're going to get one of the get added a point to one of their powers on the bottom, and then you go on to the next phase, and then you go through that, and then you go on to the next phase, and eventually you're going to have your story told. So, in my case, this is actually one that I did uh, for my daughter and my son, and um, they they caught the necromancer as he was trying to jump onto a a ship, and then they had a really cool battle, uh, you know, and and they ended to take him out, and and they and they won, they saved they saved the city, and so then and, and so then we had a really cool story as far as that goes. So, like I said, the mechanisms of the game are relatively simple and pretty straightforward. It's what the characters, the players, make out of it with their characters that is going to make this game a lot of fun. But let me talk more about that and the whole RPG influence and everything like that uh, in my final thoughts. All right, so that is Pocket Odyssey. All right, so I really like this. And as I said, it does make me feel like I'm playing a role-playing game. And, um... You know, my kids really, really like playing Dungeons and Dragons. I still play it with them a lot. I know there's some videos of me and my daughter from a couple of years ago. We we still play. It's just I know we just time makes fools of us all. I mean, but um, you know, we really enjoy playing D and D. It's something I grew up on. My kids like the whole process of the you know, like the the story and the, and the ongoing like quests and things they're on but sometimes i don't have time you know to put together like the new dungeon or the new like uh ex escapade that their players are going to go on so um uh you know I, I having something like this is really helpful so as you know like i i, I really like the idea of a shared mutual experience um i like everybody at the table being uh involved in what's going on i like them you know interacting with one another um there's nothing better than for me when i was playing this game was actually like seeing people actually getting into their characters and like saying oh well i'm an overconfident person it's like there's no problem we'll be able to take on all those goblins let's do it and everybody else is like holding that person i grab him i hold him back so he doesn't you know go right onto the tunnel and get us all killed and you know stuff like that like moments where um normally those happen when i'm playing dungeons and dragons and people are like oh you know it's like the, you you've got seven eight nine sessions under your belt and you've got this really like solidified character idea and you're really 
into it and you're into that person and you're into that character but here you just you just created this person out of some cards five minutes ago but people are just once again they're like yeah i'm, I'm into this i want to be this i want to do this quest i want to i want to i want to live this and i and i like that i like that this game inspired that now not everybody it, this isn't going to be for everybody I'll, I'll flat out say that but if you're willing to open your mind and if you are somebody that you know wanted to play wants to play our role-playing games but can't always get the people together to do it or you know somebody who always wanted to kind of dip your toes into this realm I think this is something you really want to check out. I mean, and like I said, there is so much game in this little tiny box. I, I can't say enough how awesome it is. So, so there you go. Uh, that is Pocket Odyssey. If you have any questions about it, please ask away. I'll be happy to answer those as best as I can. As always, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. And until next time, I'm the Ended Viking, telling you to have yourself one heck of an awesome day. All right, bye-bye.